Small towns have a way of fostering big dreams. Without so much light pollution, the sky becomes a canvas for painting the future. In 1950s Coalwood, West Virginia, Homer Hickman had plenty of sky to envision a future that mining coal couldn't provide him. Hello and welcome to Lights, Camera, History. October Sky was released in 1999, and even to this day, I can still hear that violin score play every time I look up at the stars. Homer Hadley Hickman was born February 19, 1943, in a small company town in Colwood, West Virginia. His father was the big cheese at an Ohio-based coal company. His mother was a homemaker, and by all accounts, he had a pretty normal childhood. I'm going to get into Colwood in this section because it's very much its own important character in the movie October Sky. But first, let's discuss Sputnik. The Cold War made for some interesting competition among the United States and the Soviet Union. Case in point, the space race. Just after World War II, the two sides began to compete in a ballistic missile showdown. Whomever had the better missiles had an edge in military preparedness. So, in order to showcase who was better, each country announced four days apart that they would attempt to launch a man-made satellite in space over the next few years. The Russians would win this one. On October 4, 1957, the Russians successfully launched Sputnik. Sputnik translates from the Russian words for together and fellow traveler. Traveler. Let's visit Colwood for just a moment. Colwood was founded by George Lafayette Carter in 1905. He constructed a mine calling it the Carter Coal Mine Company and built offices, houses, a schoolhouse, the Carter Coal Company store, a church, and more. Carter hired a dentist and doctor to provide services to his miners. Beginning mostly in the 1880s, company towns were springing up all across the United States. Even to this day, company towns still exist all across the country, just in different forms. Some examples of past and present company towns include DuPont Chemical Company, DuPont, Washington, Hershey, Pennsylvania, Grand, Missouri, Missouri Lumber and Mining Company, and Kohler, Wisconsin. They work like this. You put in an honest day's labor. In return, they provide the housing, medical treatment, dental, stores, houses of worship, schools, markets, and recreation facilities. Sounds nice to some degree. However, they were often controlling and restrictive for an employee. You were likely to become dependent on the company. Some companies would pay you in company dollars to be used at company stores. Colwood, for example, will still issue cash or credit, but if you messed around and got into debt, you were given company money as a way to be regulated. I owe my soul to the company store. The plus side, though, for a place like Colwood, it was a tight-knit community that supported a family-like company to an extent as long as you towed the company line. Nobody was more of a company man than John Hickman, Homer's father. He rose up the ranks, despite not having an engineering degree. Because of this, he was incredibly loyal to a man known as the captain. He was through and through a company man. If you're not a company man, a place like Colwood could be a bleak place to live. This is what makes October Sky such an interesting movie. It's the story of a group of high school students and their hope of a bright future with the backdrop of the very drab Colwood. The movie takes place in 1957, beginning with a clear canvas of a sky in Colwood, West Virginia, along with the rest of the town. Homer sees Sputnik and is inspired to build his own rocket. He teams up with some friends, a smart-looking classmate, to begin work on making rockets. Homer has some resistance, though. His father is not supported. But the town has a few cast of characters that help aid the boys in their rocket science. Among these are Miss Riley, the very supportive teacher played by Laura Dern, who is having some health problems. She convinces the boys to enter in a science fair, to show them naysayers, and to win scholarships. 
While all this is going on, a strike in Colwood is brewing, and eventually it happens. Along the way, Homer writes to his hero, Dr. Warner Van Braun. At the National Science Fair, Homer is sent to represent the Rocket Boys. Homer's display is well received. However, overnight, someone steals his machine-made model, the nozzle, and his autographed picture of Dr. Warner Van Braun. Homer makes an urgent phone call to his mother, Elsie, who implores John to end the ongoing strikes so that Mr. Bolden Bykowski's replacement can use the machine shop to build a replacement nozzle. John relents when Elsie, fed up with his lack of support for their son, threatens to leave him. With the town's support and replacement parts quickly sent to Indianapolis by bus, the boys win the top prize, and Homer is bombarded with college scholarship offers. He's also congratulated by Van Braun himself, though not realizing his idol's identity. Miss Riley congratulates the boys. They fire one last rocket titled Miss Riley and Homer and his father Bond. Very nice story. Cue the tears. Before I get into the big stuff, I'm going to go over some small stuff real quick. The book didn't start with Sputnik. It was just a great jumping off point for the movie. Homer never tried out or even played football. Little side note, he did help design the cannon used for football games at Virginia Tech. The book spans a longer period, not what seems like one school year. Sonny got the autographed picture of Von Braun from his grandma in the movie. He got it from his mother in the book, along with a chocolate bar. The Rocket Boys had to advertise the launches in real life. In the movie, the Rocket Boys got arrested. This never happened in real life. They were just suspected briefly. They never burned down the blockhouse, although a mock one is standing somewhere outside modern Colwood. That information is dated, not sure if it still is. So here are the bigger items, and they all have to do with characterizations. Let's start with Pops. He was actually very supportive in the book, but sometimes reluctant to be all in on his son's rocket machines. I would say it's clear he was more into football and therefore Jim rather than Homer. He even helped the boys make Cape Colwood according to Homer. The other big issue is that Homer never had to work in the mine. This storyline is fictional, adds to the concept that the mine is the antagonist. I do love the scene of him looking up at the night sky as the lift is lowered into the dark mine. However, Homer never wrote to Warner Van Braun. But hey, it makes for some good exposition, and oh, his picture was never stolen. Last but not least, the final rocket was another awk. Hickman said to this day he wished he'd named the rocket after their teacher. So there you have it. The movie and the book are pretty close. Lots of minor issues. The biggest issue is the drama created to sell a better movie. I have to say, the book is a great read for those of you that enjoyed the movie. Well, folks, that's all we have for this episode. We hope you enjoyed it. So next time you look up into the sky, dream a little bit for us.